Hello guys, we are now into 5.3, looking at comparing linear and exponential functions. So hopefully you are in the Pearson module working through that as uh, we get to here. So make sure you've worked through all of the part one in Pearson before you get to the got it. And this is where we pick up. So when I look at a table and try to decide whether it's linear or exponential, well, I know that linear functions have a constant rate of change, which means that their change in y and their change in x will always stay consistent. So here, my change in x is 1 and 1 and 1. So my change in x is good for each of those. I look at my change in y. That is a plus 2, a plus 2, and a plus 2. So yes, this is linear. Now how exponentials are different is if I create an xy table here, and I actually like to create vertical xy tables. So let's say as x is 0, as x is 1, and as x is 2. Let's see if this is changing constantly, then is the y changing constantly? So if x was 0, 6 to the 0 is 1, so 3 times 1 is 3. Then 6 to the first, well that would be 6, 3 times 6 is 18, so we see a change of 15 here. And then when x is 2, well, 6 squared will be 36. 36 times 3, 30 times 3 is 90. 6 times 3 is 18, so we get 108. I'm fairly certain that this is not a change of 15. So since this is bigger, we know that it is not linear, and it is, in fact, exponential. And we can also kind of cheat with that by saying, well, my variable's in an exponent. That's a pretty good indicator that it's going to be an exponential function. My gaps in my y get either much larger as I go or much smaller as I go. So try these two practices on your own. You'll notice that the x's here change by 1, 1, 1, and 1. And over here, all change by 1 as well. So what you're really looking at is are the y changes consistent? So pause the video and show the work to see whether they are linear or exponential. All right, so let's look at these. What we see in number one is that my change in y is 6, and then it's 24, and then it's 96. So this is definitely not linear. So we can go ahead and call that exponential. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Over here in number two, we add 3, we add 3, we add 3. So this is, in fact, linear. But when we come back to number one, let's look at this in a different manner. Let's not look at this as what terms are we adding every time we change terms. Let's try to think of it geometrically and decide, is there a way I could multiply to get there? Well, easily, from 2 to 8, I know that's multiplication by 4. 8 to 32, well, howdy doody, that works out to be multiplication by 4. And 32 to 128, that works out to be multiplication by 4. So you can guarantee that that 4 is going to be involved somewhere. But since we're multiplying, we can still go ahead and call this an exponential relationship. So now we want to look at real world situations and identify whether the real world situation is linear or exponential. So if Jack is paying $30 each month for a gym membership, we could look at this by saying the number of months and the total that he has paid. So if I look at after one month, he's paid 30. After two months, he's paid 60 total, we're talking. After three months, he's paid 90. After four months, He's paid 120, and we can see that this is a consistent change of plus 30 all the way through. So it is a linear relationship. Take a moment and look at B and try to decide on your own whether it's a linear or exponential. If you haven't done it yet, pause the video and try this on your own. We know that this bacteria is halved every day, and we start with 1,200. So I might then set up, okay, let's say days and bacteria amount. So after zero days, on the first day that we start watching it, we have 1,200. After one day, since it got halved, it's 600. After two days, since it gets halved, it's 300. After three days, it's 150. And this pattern will continue. However, when I look at the changes, there's no consistent addition or subtraction that can make this happen. What it is is multiplication by 1 half. So we know that this makes it an exponential relationship. 
All right, so real quick, think about these two situations. If every shirt costs $15, is that linear or exponential? Hopefully you thought that that is linear. Then look at number four. If a bacteria population doubles every hour, what do you think? Hopefully you thought to yourself that because we're doubling, it is an exponential situation. All right, this situation is gonna look familiar because it's essentially like finding slope. Um, this is just talking about the average rate of change for a function. So to find that rate of change, we just take the function value at B and subtract the function value at A. And then on bottom, we have B minus A. This is very, very similar to the delta Y over delta X, where you have Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. This is essentially the same thing. So now we're going to use that to investigate rate of change down here. So with um, linear functions, what do we know about the average rate of change compared to exponential functions? So take a moment, pause the video, and think about the rate of change or the slope for a linear versus an exponential. So hopefully you thought about the rate of change of a linear function staying a constant value and the rate of change of an exponential function having a value that always changes because my slope is constantly changing in that exponential function. When graphing a function, I always find it easiest to make a table. So let's make a table comparing the x values to the f of x values. And essentially, f of x is a fancy way of saying y, because it's a function relative to x. So when x is, it's good to start at 0 and have a 1 and a 2 and a 3 and a 4. And that can normally get me a pretty good vision of the line. So go ahead and do that for number 5 and for number 6. Just start by making the table. If we look at specifically what we're being asked to do, we need to backtrack just a little bit and change our table. We really only need the values of 0, 2, 4, and 6, because we're trying to look specifically at the rate of change, or the average rate of change, for in these domain areas. So the first one that we're going to do is 0 to 2, then we'll do 2 to 4, and then we'll do 4 to 6. So over here, I got rid of my 3, and I left my 1. And now just have 2, 4, 6. Over my right, I can just do 0, 2, 4, 6, and I can look at those rate of changes that way. So remember here, what we want to look at is just like finding my slope, but now it's a rate of change. It's um, my function value at B minus my function value at A, and then just B minus A. So over here, again, I don't need my 1, 6 point. I mean, that is a point, but I don't need it. So now I have 18 and 2. So my first one here will be 18, and yes, I'm just going to write on the grid for right now, 18 minus 2, and then the x value subtracted to minus 0. So we get actually 16 over 2, or a rate of change of 8. So let's look at my next one over here. I do the 2 to 4. So my function values, my f of values, are 162 minus the 18, or really I'm just looking at what is the addition happening here, over the 4 minus 2, so we know that the change in x is 2. This ends up with 144 over 70, or over 2, which then equals 72. And we can automatically see that my rate of change is changing. The last one that I would look at is my range from 4 to 6, and that will be 1,458 divided by 6 minus 4, which will give me 2 again. So I have that, sorry, there's a subtraction up here, minus 162. So then in the numerator, I get 1,296. And the denominator, I get 2 again. So I just divide by 2 and get 648. So you can see here that my rate of change has changed dramatically as I go. So then hopefully you did not write all over your graph because we want to be able to graph this. I will show you the graph here in just a moment. Um, over in number 6, this is easier. Rate of change is 2 in my x for every time. So I know that my denominator will always be 2, just like it just was. And here, my change in my f of x is 8 and 8 and 8. So what I really am going to have is 8 over 2 for all of those, or a constant rate of change of 4.
So now go ahead and try to graph both of those. This is the last thing we're going to look at in this lesson. So try those graphs. I will be back with the solution. So pause the video so you can try on your... So here's what the graph for number five would look like. It is increasing exponentially as we go up and our exponential graphs quickly run off the paper. And then at number six, we know it's a linear relationship. So it would just be a nice, easy line graph like this. Um, that is all that I have for this section. So please make sure you've worked through the entire Pearson. Uh, please make sure you do your homework, odds or evens, and let me know if you have any issues. Thank you and have a great day.